Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Children's My name is Tarina Ahuja. And political empathy at the college, and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee, as well as one of the directors of diversity and outreach here at the IOP. Before we begin, note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. Please take your seats now and join me in a round of applause for the director of the Institute of Politics, Mark Guerin, and the diversity chair of the IOP's John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, Anika Bogaria. <clears throat> well done. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you, Trina, for the nice introduction, and welcome to tonight's uh, conversation with uh, Congressman Ro Khanna and two distinguished members of the faculty. We have an unusual but really important uh, format, I think, this evening, where we'll invite the congressman to provide some reflections on his work. He's just written this important new book. Uh, and then we're privileged to have professors Sen and Sandel to offer their reflections. And then we'll invite your important questions. So Anika will provide the introductions, and then we'll get going. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Anika Bagaria, and I'm a sophomore in Courier House studying statistics with a secondary in government. Um, I serve as a board member of the Forum Student Committee. From misinformation and hate speech to unequal access and automated jobs, technology has prompted deeper political and economic inequalities than ever. However, in his recent book, Dignity in a Digital Age, Congressman Ro Khanna argues that we can employ, quote, progressive capitalism to democratize access to technology and create opportunities for all. As the daughter of Indian immigrants, I am especially excited to see South Asian voices and perspectives highlighted here at the forum this evening. And so it is my great honor to introduce Silicon Valley Congressman Ro Khanna, Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government, Michael Sandel, and Nobel Laureate, Economist, and Professor of Economics and Philosophy, Amartya Sen. Congressman Ro Khanna was elected to his first term in Congress in 2016. He additionally serves as Deputy Whip of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and was a co-chair for Pro Bernie Sanders' 2020 presidential campaign. Khanna was named the Democrat most likely to get work done during the Trump administration, passing five bills into law at this time. Named the world's most influential living philosopher by the New Statesman, Professor Michael Sandel teaches political philosophy at Harvard University. His books on topics ranging from democracy, ethics, morals, and markets have been translated into more than 30 languages. Professor Amartya Sen is a professor of economics and philosophy at Harvard University and a senior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. His several awards include the Bharat Ratna of India, the George Marshall Award, the Eisenhower Medal, and the Nobel Prize of Economics. Finally, co-moderating co our conversation with me this evening will be Mr. Mark Kieran who is the 19th director of the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Guerin has served as the White House Deputy Chief of Staff for the Clinton Administration and White House Communications Director. Thank you so much for your time, Congressman Kanna, Professor Sandel, Professor Sen, and Mr. Guerin. And I hope everyone here enjoys and learns from our conversation this evening. Join us in welcoming uh, Congressman uh, Kana and uh, Professor Sandel. Thank you. That's nice. Welcome, welcome, Congressman, Professor Sandel, Professor Sen. Professor Sandel, welcome back to the forum. It's good to be, be back. back. You've been a frequent flyer here. So right. It's, it's right. nice I to have you place. here. And Congressman Khanna, thank you. Welcome. Your thank first you. visit here, but we're thrilled to, to have you here. It's an honor. So uh, you've been introduced to our great audience here. We'd like to offer you the chance to offer your reflections on progressive capitalism and some of the things you're working on. Then we'll invite Professors Sen and Sandel to offer their reflections as well. Thank you. So Mark, thank you first for having me. Thank you for your incredible public service in the Clinton administration and your le leadership here uh, at the forum. Anika, thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to your future. And really, <laughs> it was a great uh, 
that uh, you're already so engaged. I'm not gonna embarrass Amartya Sen or Michael Sandel by being too effusive. Uh, let me just say, I think Amartya Sen is one of the great thinkers of the last 50 years. It's an incredible honor to be there, and I think Michael Sandel is one of the great philosophers of the last 50 years. So uh, I've told people that their contributions will far outdate anything in the book, and I am uh, honored uh, to be uh, on these forums. I usually don't get nervous or excited, but they have actually made me more self-conscious <laughs> of uh, participation. I was just in Galesburg, Illinois. And I don't know if you remember Galesburg, Illinois, but President Obama spoke about Galesburg, Illinois in his keynote speech in 2004. And Galesburg, Illinois is a small town that had Maytag as a factory plant. And the plant had about 5,000 jobs in that community. And one of the things that struck me talking to people in that plant is they talked about how their parents and their grandparents and their aunts and their uncles worked at this plant and how it was still a sense of family and a sense of community. In fact, uh, 15 to 20 people, 20 years after this plant had closed, came to talk to me about what the plant meant. And they talked about how they spent Christmases together and how they knew each other and knew whether someone was sick and didn't actually have a hostile view even towards the management. They all viewed each other as part of the same community. One person said, I never aspired to be a millionaire. I never aspired to do more. I just wanted to have a good life, have a good job, and this is what was possible in the community. That plant closed in 2004. President Obama did a lot of great things, but he said we were gonna have a renewal, and 20 years later, Galesburg is less prosperous. There are not more jobs there. They've seen Republican and Democratic presidents and Congresses come and go, and their life isn't much better. And they talk about their kids having to leave. They say, what's happening to our community? They talk about not believing that the next generation is gonna have productive work and community opportunities in their hometown. When you look, in my view, at the anger of American politics, it stems in part from the fact that half of the country, I would argue, has not been part of the production and wealth generation of the modern economy. My district, $11 trillion of market cap, Apple, Google, Intel, Yahoo, Cisco, LinkedIn, Tesla. You poll young people, they're very optimistic about the American dream. And the question becomes, what happened to people in other parts of the country where the dream seems not possible? I will reference two ideas from Sen Professor Sandel in uh, Professor Sen. On the idea, as Professor Sandel put it, which I would have actually quoted, but I read it after my manuscript was, point, pointed, was uh, submitted, of contributive justice. This idea that it's not enough, in my view, to have redistribution post-production, though important. We should tax people in my district more. But it is important to actually get people to contribute, to produce, to have the opportunity to make something of their lives. That has been missing in places like Gales Galesburg, Illinois. And then to Professor Sen's point, the yes, there needs to be uh, a value to freedom and free enterprise, but unrestricted capitalism, unfettered capitalism that doesn't take into account uh, community and job creation and the uh, impact on uh, locality is not actually what, me, what is good for people actually realizing their freedom or their potential or their uh, ability to contribute. 
And so I would argue that there has been a blind spot of the impact of globalization and technological advance that has left out lots of pe people and communities, and we have to fix that. There are two things, in my view, that we have to fix. First is this idea of production. We didn't invent the automobile. We didn't invent the jet engine. But we did mass produce it, and that was pretty good in the United States. We, get, we had a lot of jobs because of that. Now, we had this view that it doesn't matter if production all goes offshore. And maybe that helped consumer prices, but the reality is a lot of that uh, led to a loss of income, a lot of a loss of jobs. And the beneficiaries of it ultimately was a lot of capital. People owned the capital. It didn't really create a lot of the jobs and opportunities in these communities. And so what can we do to have some of production back in the United States? I argue, I think there is a moment where there is a bipartisan consensus on this because of COVID. People said, really, we aren't even making masks in this country because of the hollowing out of the middle class and communities. People get that that didn't work out as well. And Part, and because of the rise of China. And people said, well, we don't want all these jobs going to China, and we need to be making things in the United States. So there is a moment where we can have production, innovation in production, and those jobs back in the United States. And then on uh, technology, you know, 25 million of these digital jobs that are going to exist. These are not just coding jobs for, uh, for, for Google or Facebook. One of the ways I describe it is it used to be that, you know, with the power loom, uh, people used to make a lot of money off the power loom. And then the power loom became something everyone could use, and it actually, you no longer had a premium on what, it, uh, what you would get paid to use the power, to, to make things out of the power loom. The same thing is happening in some sense with technology. Uh, it, the, the, the new mantra in Silicon Valley is actually low code, no code jobs. These are not jobs that, uh, require a lot of advanced coding. And it's a cliche almost that every business is going to need technology. These are the new manufacturing jobs, the new retail jobs, the new healthcare jobs. These are jobs that require maybe a credential for six months. They don't require a four-year degree, to Professor Sandel's point, that we've neglected a lot of people, the, the opportunities for people who may not get a four-year degree. And they pay on average 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars. How can we figure out uh, more access to these jobs, and it doesn't require at its best people to move. You can stay in communities. Now, one counter to this that I learned in Gilbert is they said, look, if you're working remotely, it's not the same community as working at a factory. And there is something that is not all figured out, that it's just having these decentralized jobs. But at the very least, we need to have uh, some vision of what we're gonna do to bring back prosperity in places like Galesburg. Now, I think that we ought to pick 15, 20 of these communities. By the way, they're not just white working class like Galesburg is. There's the west side of Chicago is a similar story that William Julius Wilson wrote about in terms of manufacturing that left in the 60s and 70s, and nothing has come in its place. In fact, one of the things that is so remarkable is if you look at the language that William Julius Wilson uses to describe the flight of jobs in black America, and you look at Deaton and Case's book on Deaths of Despair, it's almost identical. You could think that they were writing about the same economic condition. So having a message and a vision for job creation in places left out and having a real commitment to that, I think is a imperative to try to stitch the country back together and will address some of the, the uh, fundamental needs that has led to some of the anger and resentment in our politics. Thank you very much. Congressman, uh, Professor Sen, you've written a very thoughtful forward uh, to the Congressman's book. Can we invite you into this conversation for your reflections? Well, that was a fantastically um, perceptive and, and uh, uh, far-seeing presentation. Um, I think one of the things we have to bear in mind, and no one is as clear uh, on this as, as Roe is, um, that on one side, 
we cannot neglect uh, the contribution of technology, the contribution of the um, important factors of production, including capital. And at the same time, we have to see what kind of life it generates for people. Um, Adam Smith, who could be rightly seen as the father of modern economics, uh, uh, brought out that it's not so much a paradox, but the dual perspective, clearly one side, you ought to do uh, economy of large scale and particularly specialization and skill formation, which is very important in order to make uh, an economy um, expand and be efficient. And at the same time, we have to see that it does not regiment people's life in such a narrow way that you're specialized and hugely skilled, but you do only one thing. Uh, Adam Smith noted that he knew people who throughout their life had never done anything other than hitting a nut or a bolt with a hammer uh, from the morning to the evening every day uh, through their life. Uh, then, uh, he contacted and slipped out people who were interested in, say, Greek philosophy and Roman concerns and so on. None of that. And instead of that, uh, you have uh, a kind of regimented life. I think what we have to do is to have the kind of broadness of perspective which Rokana uh, um, uh, uh, was rightly drawing our attention to, whereby we can do the thing that technology and the broadening of production allows. And at the same time, we do not get drowned uh, in just repetitive activity. I mean, underlying that was the central notion that it's through our mind, through our thinking, to our understanding of what the world is, that we generate some kind of understanding of ourselves. Uh, and that requires, uh, on one side, um, uh, reflection uh, on the nature of the world and, and education uh, and, 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 and freedom. Uh, on the other side, we have to uh, not be uh, uh, totally uh, subservient to uh, um, technological uh, miracles that we might be seeking. And I find it very striking, and uh, I must say, when I was reading uh, those book, which I think is a uh, really masterpiece, uh, brilliantly written book. Uh, the thing that we constantly are reminded of was uh, an analogy with Smith, with Adam Smith, namely, uh, you can't just uh, live on uh, a kind of now focus technology on one side, nor can you uh, live without the technological concerns that we do need. Um, I think it's this duality that um, is in present in the, in, in the writings of uh, 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 not only Adam Smith, Emmanuel Kant, uh, uh, later on, uh, uh, Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill, and others, and at the same time, in understanding that it's, it's the ability to broaden the ground, is the ability 
to understand the world to be a wider, broader, greater place than than we might have first thought. Uh, that makes human beings what they are. I was particularly grateful, if I may do a bit of a rational thing, I, I teach uh, a course jointly with two of my colleagues. Uh, I used to do with Michael at one stage not long ago. Uh, now I do with um, uh, Eric uh, Maskin and, 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 and Barry Mazer, a mathematician uh, of great standing. Uh, next year, we are trying to teach a course, uh, what is it like to be a human being? What makes us human? And that question is really the central issue that we have to address. And uh, it, it's to uh, enormous uh, glory that uh, the, one of the leading uh, upcoming great political leaders today, namely Joe Kammer, takes on that issue in that very, very broad form. said. Thank you. That was a great, great lead into Professor Sandel. Thank you so much for joining well, us. Amartya, I would like to join you in singing the praises of Roe's book. Ro, you're very modest or shy because you gave a wonderful opening talk without once mentioning the title of your book. <laughs> and it's really the book that we're celebrating and your visit. It's called Dignity in a Digital age. And what makes it so important a book for public discourse today is that it connects technology and the digital age with really the two biggest questions we face. One is about work and the other is about democracy. So I would like to really build upon the themes of the book by putting to you two questions. And the first one is about work. Many people worry that technology is coming for, coming for their jobs. That underlies the anxiety you were describing in the places you visit. And when people worry that technology will, and robots, will make work obsolete, at least for a great many people, very often the reply they get is not a very consoling or sympathetic reply. They're told, well, technology, trade, maybe we can do something about the effects of jo uh, uh, on jobs. But technology, we're going to have to get used to it. Technology is like a force of nature. It's not subject to our deliberate control. And the real question is, how can we adapt to this powerful force? As if technology and its direction and the shape of innovation were like the weather beyond the reach of human agency or political control. I think, uh, I think this is a mistaken view of technology, and much of what you say in the book suggests that you think so too. We can direct technology so that it doesn't just rob people of jobs, though many people, I'm afraid to say in Silicon Valley, think that that's what technology is for, that that's what they're doing. They, they can replace cashiers with kiosks, and won't that improve economic efficiency? And then maybe later, if that's a problem for the people who lost their jobs, we can redistribute the increase in GDP to, to help take care of those who were put out of jobs. But as I read the book, you don't see it that way. T technology and its direction, innovation and its direction, is something we can help shape 
But that requires a lot of work and political debate on our part. And one way of directing technology to public purposes to the common good is through the tax system. And you mentioned this striking finding by the economist Darren Asimoglu at MIT that, of course, lots of companies want to replace workers with machines. The tax system gives them a big incentive to do it because we tax labor at 25 percent, but after various allowances, we tax the kiosk, the machine, at about zero. So that's something, one thing we could do, the tax system changing the incentives for replacing workers with machines. But I suspect that you don't think, and I would agree, that that would be enough. I mean, no. And what, but that raised the question of investment. Who decides what we invest in, what purposes we invest in? Do we invest in replacing workers or enhancing their productivity so they can share in the fruits of the innovation. And so my first question, the one about work is, do you think it will require more deliberate public investment rather than relying on private investment and venture capital alone to redirect innovation and technology to serve public purposes rather than having robots replace people? That's question number one. And question number two is about democracy. A lot of the criticism, especially of social media companies, is to do with violations of privacy. And that's an important debate. And more recently about the massive disinformation and the conspiracy theories and the hate speech that's promulgated. And the tech companies, the social media companies are scrambling to try to figure out what to do about that. But there's a further problem, it seems to me, and I wonder what you think, which has to do with the business model itself. The basic business model is, uh, of these social media companies, is to commandeer our attention and hold it for as long as possible so that they can capture more personal data about us so that they can use that data to try to sell us stuff. That's, in simple terms, the business model. And that seems to me a pernicious business model that's deeply corrosive of democracy, not only because it depends on hooking people with sensationalistic and often false and hateful uh, information and news feeds, but the whole idea of capturing our attention and directing it to the empty, banal, and sensationalistic stuff that draws our attention distracts us from more important things to pay attention to, especially civic questions, public discourse civic education. So if the business model is the problem, should we go after targeted advertising, online advertising as such, either by, as some states have begun to do, taxing targeting, uh, targeted online advertising, not only to raise revenue but to discourage it, or more ambitiously, as some in Congress now have proposed, and Cory Booker signed on in the Senate, to ban it. What do you think? Well, let me answer both thoughtful uh, questions. On your first point, uh, I, and here I think uh, your comments coincide in some ways with Professor Sen's comments. If Professor Sen is saying uh, technology is not the whole thing, that what it means to have a good life as a human being matters more, and technology is a tool. And you're saying, you know, we've just thought that technology is just its own domain, uh, but maybe it ought to be uh, subject to the same democratic accountability yeah. as anything else. 
And really the book, to the extent that there's, there's no original contribution of philosophy and no original contribution of technology, but it says why aren't we thinking about the same theories of democratic accountability and philosophy yeah. to technology? Why, why do we exempt this whole sphere of technology and innovation and not applying some of the same principles in terms of how we shape that? Yeah. And so when we apply that and when we say, okay, it's not just innovation for innovation's sake and technology for technology's sake and just go do whatever you want, uh, when we say, is this encouraging uh, human beings to, 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 be, to have a good life, well, maybe we think, okay, it's Instagram having teenage suicide uh, and having mental health issues is something we want to regulate. Is it encouraging uh, the types of investments in places that have been totally left out, uh, or if that's not a place that's going to be invested, we do need, in my view, public investment uh, and a role for public investment in places uh, if for uh, places where the private sector may not invest. And I think that the entire point, if there's one point that I want people uh, to get out of the book, it is that we, as a democratic society, are in charge, not the technology companies, that there shouldn't be an exemption from democratic deliberation uh, in decision making about innovation and technology. It has to be in the service of those, uh, those goals. Uh, and so certainly I think in terms of public investment or public-private investment, that's important. And I would argue that that's what we're doing in part with the Competes Act, with Intel now uh, investing in part in uh, Ohio and Columbus, creating these jobs because there was a decision of public investment that's just the start uh, and we can do it much br more broadly. In terms of the business model itself being a problem, uh, I would argue that that is a model, a, a, a problem. Of course, the attention economy is, is, is universal. I mean, the television competes for attention, newspapers compete for attention. But the difference, as you point out, is here the monetization of data uh, from uh, attention uh, is what makes it uh, so much worse. So when the newspaper, yeah, they want you to keep reading the New York Times or the Harvard Crimson, but they're not taking more and more of your data the more time you spend. Uh, the television isn't taking your data. Here you're having their data taken from you. And so I think that the Internet Bill of Rights uh, of saying you should not have, you should have the right to your data and that shouldn't be taken to, from you will force some change in the, uh, in the business model. It will force, you know, the, the, the idea that, you know, with the newspapers, that famous line of newspapers have uh, a commercial basis but aren't fully commercialized. They have some role as a stakeholder in democracy. That may be more possible for social media if there, is rule, if there are rules that require data minimization and not the commercialization of data. And to answer the specific question on targeting, I am for stricter controls on targeting but not the elimination. In other words, I don't have a problem with a pizza company uh, targeting me after, we're, after I'm done here, if they want to say, I hear Boston cream pie, if they want to have, I, if they want to target me with Boston cream pie ads, I'm not that concerned rather than seeing ads from uh, California where I'm not going to be. But if the, if the targeting uh, is uh, in, in, in areas uh, that are more problematic of race, of gender, uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, pushing uh, certain ideologies, and that's where I think we need a, a lot more regulation. So I'm sort of in the, in the middle ground of what types of targeting should be allowed and shouldn't be allowed. Great. Makes sense. Anika. Um, thank you so much for all those remarks. Um, I'd love to touch more on that point about job replacement and job enhancement that you mentioned, Professor Sandel. Um, specifically, um, I'm thinking about an editorial featured in the Boston Globe that you co-wrote with Congressman John Lewis in 2018. Um, and you reflect on technology and creating an America that will usher in this freer and fairer world. Specifically, you and Congressman Lewis wrote, quote, in many ways, technology rights are the new civil rights. Tech leaders must strive to close the digital divide and provide a foundation of economic opportunity to minority communities for the jobs of the future. Um, and so I'm wondering specifically, how should tech leaders strive to promote outreach to minority communities and education and job uh, training efforts along those lines? The racial wealth gap is about 10 to 1. In my view, you will not overcome the racial wealth gap if you don't overcome the racial wealth generation gap. The racial wealth gap is growing. It's not shrinking. 
And you have this situation in Silicon Valley where some of the platforms are popularized by African Americans, Latino Americans, but they're not on the board. They're not the recipients of venture capital. 0.32% of venture capital is going to black women entrepreneurs. 0.32% of, of the entire venture capital. Totally unrepresented in the people who are writing the checks. They're unrepresented in senior positions. So this is a enormous issue. I write it in the book, I write, I say, you know, it was easy for people in Silicon Valley to march against the brutality of George Floyd, which was thousands of miles away. It's much harder to march about greater inclusion about practices within these tech companies and the generation of wealth. That's a much harder thing to, to, to effectuate. And so I, go, I have a number of different policy recommendations of what we can do to get more uh, capital to these communities, what we can do to have more bl black and brown and women uh, actually being the check writers, what we can do to have more hiring at HBCUs and more digital opportunity. But the, the one takeaway I would say is that, again, there has to be intentionality. If you are just a startup company and you are thinking, how do I grow as fast as possible, you're not necessarily going to think about issues of inclusion and issues of justice. You're just thinking, I want to get off the ground. And then once you get scale, and if you don't have those issues, it becomes hard to change the culture. So the question is, without an intervention of public policy, a deliberate intervention that recognizes that we're a country that had 250 years of slavery and a hundred some years of Jim Crow, and that we've had the subjugation and unfairness towards women, and that you're not just gonna have suddenly the free market be a corrective course in equity, you're, it's not gonna happen. So we need deliberate intentional policies that are going to get uh, communities participating in this wealth generation. Anik and I will be going out to your questions. So we Do have, we want to give Professor please, No, no, yeah. Uh, no, that, go, go ahead. I was just going to, we'll answer. get to you, to, just to, so students and our guests know, microphones here, here, and in the two lowish boxes. So we'll be starting, Anik and I, and I will be recognizing questions in a bit, but just to give you fair warning to get to the mics. Professor Sena. Well, um, I, I would like to, uh, I, I agree very much with the answer you just gave. I would like to, um, uh, sharpen the, uh, the earlier question on banning uh, targeted online advertising. Now, you drew a, an important distinction between targeting based on protected categories, such as race, gender, ethnicity, and so on, rather than, say, location data or what sort of product you had searched for online. And I, my understanding of the legislation that's been proposed that would ban some is that it would ban the kind that you worry most about. And I'd support that. You would support that. Yeah. Now, on the business model, stepping back on the broader issue of whether uh, gleaning people's data by giving them something seemingly free and therefore having the incentive to send out feeds that tantalize and titillate and capture their attention. Uh, one alternative to that business model would be to say, you've got to do it by subscription. You can't make your money by trying to send out provocative news feeds, sensational news, feed, news feeds, and hook people and glean the data. You can send out the, all the news feeds you want and all the pictures, of cat videos, and so on, but people should pay for it. They should subscribe. Now, it'd be interesting to do a, a poll here on how many people would prefer uh, that kind of world uh, to the world that we currently have. I don't know, would you, do you have a hunch what they would say? Anita? I don't know. I mean. If we could do a raise hands, maybe that could work. Um, we'll do an Insta poll. Here. We'll do an Insta poll. How about that? Yep. We'll publish that. What does that, that mean? Is uh, that an on online Instagram, media using thing? the social okay, media, right. we can uh, do a little poll and see what people think. But I would, uh, I would be interested to know, Ro, whether you think that all things considered, that would be a better world than the one we've got. And perhaps you could build into that with the Internet Bill of Rights that you. So I would, I, I would be 
reluctant to say we need to mandate that everyone moves to a subscription model, uh, the way I would get at it is to, to have regulation in two areas. I think the more that we can have regulation saying you own your data and if you don't affirmatively consent to having your data used, uh, then they can't use it and then you need to know what's going to happen to your data. Uh, I think that would provide a large disincentive for the abuse of it. And if we had something, you know, Jack Balkin, who's a law professor, I said the minimization of data, that you shouldn't be able to use data for things that aren't uh, I I important. If we combine that also with strong antitrust legislation, because part of the problem is you don't have much of a shot. If someone here has a brilliant idea for a subscription model, then maybe uh, people would like to hear uh, tune in to hear more reasonable debate as opposed to, you know, I know what I need to say today. I could say 10 things today that could ensure that this forum was on the evening news. I won't because it would make me look silly. Uh, but there would be 10 things I could say outrageous that would suddenly be uh, on the evening news uh, or, or, and, and be viral on, on social media. But the problem is that a lot of those companies that may want to have alternative models don't have much of a chance. Uh, given the competitive landscape. And so my view is having an Internet Bill of Rights, uh, strong data protection combined with antitrust may at least create the space for subscription model companies to emerge and then it can be the marketplace of ideas. I don't know if Professor Sen is here. I think this is a very interesting uh, debate and I, I can see the last one particularly that, uh, that uh, well made. Um, I think one of the difficulties is that we cannot solve a problem which requires in some ways almost infinite creativity by finding a formula which works. And I, I think my difficulty uh, with Michael's thing would be partly also the subscription is a, is a good way of thinking about it, but it can also become a, a frozen method of thinking about it. I think I, I can't, uh, uh, I can't um, forget the time, maybe about 15 years ago, uh, at the time of Tony Blair and so on, suddenly we were told that what we ought to do is public-private partnership. Uh, almost everything got eclipsed by not private, public, not private, but public-private partnership. Uh, the difficulty however is that that itself fell into a, a frozen uh, uh, way of thinking about it. I remember, I think it was in Daily Telegraph, a cartoon in the morning uh, where they, the doctor uh, 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 with a patient and the doctor is something explaining something to the patient and what is written there is to say uh, the doctor telling the patient I will slowly go on explaining to you public private partnership until you start feeling sleepy and Paul uh, that the whole idea that somehow what began as a, as a new departure can may become nothing other than a kind of tool of reputation is a danger. I think this is, I think one of the ways I think the book was uh, uh, book is fantastic is that when you're talking about technology, when you're talking about humanity, when you're talking about bearing in mind uh, who owes what to whom and what we can do, there are a kind of infinite uh, variation of thinking that we might bring into the, to the story. And we can't, as human beings, we can't afford to lose that. I mean, the we would be needing all the technology, all the math, all the literature uh, that lie behind uh, the human uh, uh, 
cognition as well as uh, cognition. But the fact is, we need a kind of liberation also, which is really very, very central to, to uh, any creativity that human beings have produced over the last thousands of years. Um, so, uh, yes, I think there are nice ideas that would emerge, like um, Michael referred to the subscription model, which is a good model. But we have to really go well beyond uh, the, the idea of uh, creativity on a channel as opposed to creativity in a much wider form to fund. And uh, I think if there was anything that the great um, uh, reflection uh, produced, whether we are thinking about uh, uh, the uh, Confucian thing or Buddha's idea of the Arabic uh, innovation in, in, in math, uh, or the or Euclid and the and the uh, and the and the Greek innovation. There's always a departure, and I think um, it's really remarkable that uh, um, uh, uh, Ro has pointed us in that direction, which is really. Uh, quite, in my judgment, quite simple. So I don't think we will get a solution to the problem in the form that this is, we don't want to do uh, a, a shared view, but a subscription view. I don't think we will going to get it. We have to be uh, much more uh, uh, innovative, much more uh different from uh each other in 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 generating a world uh, in which we can happily live thank you professor anika i think we should go around the room here now okay. with some great questions here i see people lining up we'll have to get you back congressman with all the questions but why don't we start right here and we'll go around the room please okay. introduce yourself let's get some pithy questions so we can uh, can get through as many as we can, and obviously they end with a question mark. Okay, um, great. Thank you so much for such a rich uh, conversation. My name is Pariru. I'm a PhD student at Harvard. I'm in the field of science and technology studies, which looks at the interface of science and the politics of knowledge and society. Um, I have a question for Congressman Khanna and then uh, Professor Sen and Professor Sandel also. So, uh, Congressman Khanna, you talked about sort of technology and the digital as an alternative to the capitalist regime that American politics has been captured by. Um, but I'm thinking about kind of the way that the current technological um, institutions are set up, and it does seem like technology and capital are very much hand in hand. So sort of the Silicon Valley model is one that has a lot of wealth amassed to it. And so I'm wondering um, how you sort of how you sort of think about the challenge of technology and capital being deeply coupled, especially in the American model, and what would be spe would, would be special about technology in this in this way that would help uplift um, poorer communities and do something that uh, capital hasn't been been, been able to do. And my question to Professor Sen and Professor Sandel is, um, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit on your ideas of the moral implications of making work um, technologically fueled. So Professor Sen alluded to kind of questions of what makes us human, but I'm wondering if you could say something about how bringing technology deeply into our work lives has any moral implications on what it means to be a human being and um, and what the, what the institutional challenges are in, get, in making democratic accountability the center, the center stage when it comes to technology. So obviously, Technology is all pervasive, but what are the institutional challenges due to yeah. which we aren't able to ask questions Great. of democratic accountability um, in the current sort of American Great. political system? Thank you. No, that's terrific. Three good questions. Congressman? 
Well, I describe myself as a, a progressive capitalist, and, and the reason I believe in free enterprise, and uh, obviously my thinking is heavily influenced by uh, uh, Professor Sen's work in development as freedom, but, in, uh, but a simple, as I understand it, view, is it's fine for people to have the freedom to transact and you don't need everything under the government control, right? You have a market discipline. It's not like an entrepreneur has total freedom, but you probably want places where uh, you have the uh, ability to, to innovate or transact uh, in, in ways that give you uh, some op uh, opportunity for expression where you don't have to come to the United States Congress or your legislature to approve everything. Uh, at the same time, uh, we can have a deeper conversation about the basics that you may be required to have, and that's the deep uh, conversation of philosophy to be able to uh, it, it live out what that freedom is. But on the concept of progressive capitalism, my view is one, we've got to think about the healthcare and the education and what, what does it mean so you actually have freedom. And we have to think about what is the role that the state can play uh, in making sure that you have the opportunity to work and have a meaningful contribution uh, to jobs. Technology, I don't think you can say one way or the other, is that gonna make it easier or not easier? In some ways it could make it easier. It may allow for remote work, it may allow people to stay. In other ways it may make it harder because they may have the agglomeration of uh, uh, the rewards to a few people. But what we ought to be doing is, as a, is, a, is the argument is that there is a role for the state uh, not just in the providing of healthcare and education and the basics, but also in directing the investments uh, and thinking through uh, how do we have the decentralization of opportunity and that we can't just let that uh, to a totally unfettered market, but that we ought to be thinking about how markets ultimately serve uh, the, 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 the interests of both human flourishing and the common good. Well, direct, I would like to pick up, it's a great set of questions. I would like to pick up, uh, Rohan, what you said about directing investment, which I think is really at the heart of the question. And it goes back to, uh, uh, well, whether capitalism or a progressive capitalism can uh, tame and direct technology and make it serve human purposes and public purposes or whether there has to be a greater role in direct public investment to achieve that. Now, under progressive capitalism, the assumption is that the private sector is the primary instrument for investment, but it can be directed through mainly tax incentives and public-private partnerships, that kind of thing, along with shoring up the safety net redistribution. But if we were persuaded that the kind of public investment we need now to deal with climate change, for example, is not going to come about through tax incentives and public-private partnership, then that would suggest a bigger institutional shift away from relying on giving incentives to private investors and venture capitalists toward some kind of federal investment authority that would deliberate about fundamental public purposes, infrastructure, climate change, climate change, remediation, in which case it's no longer exactly progressive capitalism, it's something closer to a social democratic public system of investment. Marx don't call it progressive capitalism, because yeah. we, but but I, I I would I would say look FDR of course most famously in the New yeah. Deal, yeah. Uh, who I think was a would call himself a capitalist uh, had uh, you know we made about three thousand or four thousand planes uh, and then he mobilized the government and we made fifty thousand planes in in the course of a year and of course all of Silicon Valley is so derivative of public investment, right? It's DARPA that comes up uh, with Vint Cerf with so much of the internet. It's NSF that links up universities. It's DARPA that does the GPS. So the idea that we need public directed investment as well, direct investment, I think there's definitely a role for that. And, and uh, I guess I would argue we have, that is a question, the specifics are to figure out as a democratic society of where that balance is between how much of it is the uh, private sector investment, how much of it is public-private partnership, where is the place that's best for direct 
uh, public investment. But we, we, we can have all of that within what I would argue is a free enterprise capitalist system and uh, has been our tradition and there are times where Roosevelt, I would argue, is probably the most direct uh, investment. And, uh, and now with Biden, I think we're seeing, you know, both in the commitment to infrastructure, direct federal investment, and, uh, and in this Competes Act, some of the direct uh, federal investment on research. Professor Sen, and then we'll take it. I agree with that. <laughs> I'd quite like to hear what the general audience reaction has been to this very interesting issue that we've been discussing in over the last few minutes. Is there someone going to respond from the public? I, I think we, yeah, we could, we could go around and take some Perfect. questions. Perfect, yeah, if we can get the next, next question sure. up here, please. I think, uh, we'll, I think we'll get a sense of that, Professor. Thank you. A uh, question for Professor Sandel. Um, and I want to ask a question about your book, Tyranny of Majority. So today we talked about um, tyranny of, sorry, meritocracy. Um, so today we talked about dealing with the threat of technology. Is there an overlap between that and what you talk about in your book about how we address the tyranny of meritocracy? I think there is a close connection on that score, especially in the emphasis on the dignity of work, which is very much a theme in Congressman Khanna's book, the dignity of work in a way underlies many of the, uh, much of the analysis of technology in the book and also many of the proposed policy solutions. Uh, when Congressman Khanna goes to communities, rural communities that have been hollowed out and deindustrialized and are, are uh, without work, what, what he hears and what he describes in the book is not only a loss of living standards, but a sense of loss of human dignity and of civic uh, place in, in civil society, respect, recognition. And I worry very much about that as well in the tyranny of merit and what strikes me um, and impresses me about the broad moral framing of dignity in a digital age is the way in which Congressman Khanna connects the problem of technology with this fundamental question of the dignity of work and what we can do about it. We'll go right here. Question for Representative Khanna. My name is Michael Zhao. I'm a first year at Harvard. I'm actually a constituent of yours from Cupertino, so thank oh, you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, there's a growing bipartisan push for more regulation of Silicon Valley, but in today's era of move fast and break things, it seems that advances in technological innovation from artificial intelligence to cryptocurrency is far outpacing the pace at which the government is effectively regulating the industry. Uh, and I was wondering, given the speed, what are your thoughts on how the government can best regulate tech uh, tech in a way that broadly promotes, as you said, uh, principles of democratic accountability without stifling the overall growth of the industry. We need people like you to go into public service. I mean, they, no, I, I'm serious. The, the challenge is that, uh, first of all, we need to have a beefed up FTC, FCC, uh, DOJ with technologists and people in technology uh, who understand the regulation. Uh, one of the things that you ask these tech companies about GDPR and some of their interns wouldn't notice the fines. I mean, the fines are insignificant and they go forum shopping into the place with the least enforcement. And they have dark patterns that totally manipulate the, past the regulations. And so what we need is uh, thoughtful, passionate people uh, who understand technology saying, okay, I'm going to help uh, answer the call of my country or the, the, and, and help shape uh, policy. And there's a huge gap. There's a technological gap in, in those who are regulating and, and, and those who are uh, I I innovating. I and that is part of the lack of democratic accountability because you know the, the amazing thing is that Apple computers has done more for privacy than the entire United States Congress. And they're not perfect, but who made who made it the, 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 the Tim Cook, who I respect, in charge of how much privacy we have? Go right here. Hi. Um, like Michael, I'm also a constituent. Uh, my name is Sarah Rajaj. I'm uh, studying history of science, a sophomore at the college uh, from Fremont. And Wonderful. I mean, as you well know, um, our district is the only one on the mainland US that is majority Asian. And 
I guess my question for you is how can execs of big tech companies in our district and um, elsewhere in the Bay Area um, make informed decisions that impact the lives of all Americans uh, when we, they live and work in such an insulated and homogenous area with their boardrooms even more so? Well, the, uh, of course, thrust of the book is that they need to look for talent and opportunity uh, across the country in black and brown communities and in rural communities. But if I could have two minutes and I'll tell you, you know, my story. I mean, my grandfather, uh, Amarnath Vidyalankar, who's my hero, spent, uh, he worked for someone named Lala Lajpat Rai, who was a big person in the Indian independence movement. And he spent four years in jail uh, at different parts of Indian independence. He'd passed away when I was nine years old, but he's such a legend in our family that uh, his stories and his life uh, had, had great influence to me. And I was born in Philadelphia in 1976. And then I had, you know, when uh, Donald Trump had that famous moment where he told uh, Ilhan Omar to go back where she came from, all the media wanted to know, did you ever, when you were playing Little League baseball or basketball, have people say that, go back to India? And I said, I'm sure there were people who said that, but you know what I remember? I remember uh, the teachers who believed in me, who one of my ninth grade teachers, who I just got a text from, who said, you have to publish something in ninth grade. And I had this letter to the editor that was published. And I remember coaches who believed in me. And I believe, remember Little League coach, you know, folks who, 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 who gave me a chance. And at the age of 40, this country elected me to represent arguably the most economically powerful and prosperous place in the world. Probably more wealth has been created in this region than ever in humanity. When you have a story like mine, you can't help but be hopeful about the prospects of this country. When you look at the amazing, incredible diversity of the Congress, I did not think that there would be they're never going to elect an Indian staffer on Capitol Hill. Today, there are four Indian Americans of different origins. There's a Vietnamese American who's running for Secretary of State of Georgia. The country that you will grow up into will achieve, in my view, the multiracial, multiethnic democracy. And so I am actually very, very hopeful about the ability of all of us in the Valley and others to, to work towards this if we're intentional about it. Congressman, thank you. Our time is in, but that's a perfect, I think, Anika, place to, to pause with that inspiration. You certainly honor us here at the Institute of Politics and the Kennedy School with your public service, Professor Sandell and Professor Sen. Thank you so much. We have three forums this week. We invite you back. Tomorrow we'll have Bob Greenstein here from the Center for Budget Priorities with Jason Furman. On Wednesday, Congressman Jamie Raskin uh, will be here. And then on Thursday, E.J. Dion and Miles Rappaport will be here. So it's all online. Join me in thanking the Congressman, Professor Sen, and Press President.